I've been playing a lot of indie games recently, and one of the genres I've really enjoyed is the mystery genre. I like the intrigue, the thrill of tracking down clues and piecing together the bigger picture, but most of all I just love the satisfaction that comes with cracking a case. But after playing a crap ton of indie mysteries, it's pretty obvious that not all are created equal. Some leave you with feelings of wonder or horror at whatever truth you just uncovered, while others leave you scratching your head for all the wrong reasons, wondering why you just invested all that time for such a disappointing payoff. Some games make your brain hurt by locking their solution behind deductive reasoning and logic puzzles, while others are so uninvolved it's hard to justify why they aren't movies instead of games. So that got me wondering, what makes a mystery game, and more importantly, what makes a good mystery game? This video is split into two parts. The first will be a discussion of the mystery genre in general, and the key elements that I think make a great detective game. The second is my actual top 10 mystery games, but you can kind of think of that as an excuse to keep talking about game design by highlighting how those games avoid common pitfalls and excel at key genre tropes. If you want to skip ahead to the ranking, check that timestamp in the description, but I'm hoping this discussion will really inform my top 10. Also, I'm trying something new here, so if you like this format, let me know. I am still working on other things, like more Zelda content, but for more on that, stay tuned at the end of the video for a channel update. Okay. I think a truly great mystery game has to accomplish three things. First, it has to ask a question that's genuinely intriguing. If the mystery doesn't draw me in, if I'm not propelled forward by a desire to unravel the game's secrets, then I won't be as invested in the detective work. This is a job for the writers, to craft a compelling hook and tease the player's curiosity with smaller mysteries along the way. Almost all story-based games do this to some extent, but in the mystery genre, the question takes center stage. This is often a murder or a theft, but it could also be a disappearance, an abandoned area, an unexplained paranormal phenomenon, or anything else that gets you invested in the story. The possibilities are endless, but without a compelling question, it's hard to even call the game a mystery. Second, a great mystery game has to provide a satisfying answer. Actually, most games have to provide multiple answers, with certain big reveals representing twists in the narrative, and the biggest reveal being the climax and ultimate denouement. This is a big deal because it can color your entire experience. Many games, and I will name a few in this video, fumble this step, providing unsatisfactory answers. No answers at all, or in the worst cases, answers that make the entire game feel like a pointless exercise. But the best stories reward you with solutions that stick with you long after the game is over. And really, that's one of the best rewards that video games have to offer. It's worth saying here that this structure is somewhat genre neutral. What I mean is that a mystery can be a classic detective story, but it doesn't have to be. In Backbone, Disco Elysium, or Frog Detective, you play as hard-boiled PIs, with crime scenes, evidence, suspects, and the rest of the genre tropes you know and love. But games like Gone Home, Strange Horticulture, or Twelve Minutes are also mysteries, even though they aren't about actual detectives. I'll probably use the terms mystery game and detective game somewhat interchangeably, because I still consider the player to be doing detective work in those games, but it's worth noting that games without detectives, or even crimes, can still be great mysteries. Anyway, those two elements, the question and the answer, constitute the narrative structure of a mystery. But the third thing I want from a great mystery game has a lot more to do with design. It's the actual detective work, the methods you use to start from a question and arrive at an answer. This is possibly the hardest element to get right, but it's also the thing that makes a mystery game a game. Usually my first thought when I hear about a story-heavy game is, that sounds great, but what do you actually do in this game? So what skills should a good mystery involve? Which skills make the player feel like a real detective? Well, I've thought a lot about this, and I think there are four fundamental detective skills. Those are observation, deduction, interrogation, and hypothesis testing. I have to test this just in case, but I, I never thought it would actually happen. Of course, there are sometimes other, smaller, more specific skills, but let's take a closer look at those four. Observation is everything to do with your five senses, and it's probably the first thing you think about when you picture a detective. Whether it's examining a crime scene, staking out a location, or scanning a suspect head-to-toe Sherlock Holmes style, observation is the means by which detectives gather material to form the basis of their deductions. In video games, this can take the form of reading documents, listening to background sounds, tailing suspects, observing scenes from various angles, and hunting for clues. In some cases, those clues are distinct objects that can be clicked and cataloged and stored in your inventory for later perusal. In other cases, clues are static parts of the environment, and it's the player's job to determine what's important. Some games trust the player to make all the observations, but most hand a portion of that work to your character. For instance, when you find a clue in Disco Elysium, your character does some editorializing to make sure you know exactly what you're looking at. These look like the same tire tracks I saw earlier, in front of the whirling in the 
Either way, this is a fundamental part of detective work, and usually the jumping off point in a new investigation. Deduction is the main course. It's all about drawing logical connections between events, and understanding the underlying principles and patterns and rules that govern the game world. When deduction appears on its own, without the other detective skills, it's better recognized as puzzle solving. For instance, the puzzles in Baba Is You are all about clever deductive reasoning, but nobody would say that that game is a mystery. There's also a distinction between puzzles that purely challenge your logical thinking and puzzles that ask you to synthesize all the information you're taking in, which I would differentiate by calling micro-puzzles and macro-puzzles. So for example, think of the puzzles in Zelda Dungeons. Micro-puzzles are the kind that are contained in a single room, like a sliding block puzzle. These require concentrated bursts of reasoning, but after you leave the room, you can pretty much forget about them forever. Macro puzzles are the kind that require you to understand the relationship between different rooms, or even the entire structure of the dungeon. These are almost always the best kinds of puzzles, in my opinion, because they force you to consider the big picture, even when you can never zoom out far enough to actually see it. Both types of puzzle can be clever, but macro puzzles are what I think of when I think of deduction. Trying to understand how evidence, locations, and witness testimony fit together can fry your brain, but it's also, you know, how you solve a mystery. Sometimes it feels like games can't help themselves from doing this step for me, which is bad because it robs players of satisfying moments. For example, in Paradise Killer, I found pink flower petals scattered at the scene of the crime. I didn't know what to make of it, but then the game told me. Those petals match the ones on Yuri's hat. Instead of letting me draw a connection between the crime scene and Yuri's character model, the game just stepped in and did it for me. Thanks. This is related to a larger problem, which is that games have a tricky time testing players' deductive reasoning without partially or completely revealing the answers. If deduction is the core gameplay element in Mysteries, then proving you know the answer is like beating the final boss. As we go through my top 10, I'll talk about four different structures that games use to put player deductions to the test, each of which changes the style and pacing of the story. I'll also tell you which approach is my favorite and why. Interrogation is the human element, dealing with suspects, navigating conversations, and picking up on subtleties like implied motives, oblique references, or deception. In video games, this usually takes the form of dialogue trees and contextual systems that allow you to ask NPCs about evidence, locations, and each other. Sometimes it's bolstered by human elements like voice acting or even FMV, which gives the player even more material to run past their inner psychologist. This is a place where good writing and design can really shine, probably because it's also the element that's most abstracted from real life. You can't ask an NPC everything you would ask a human, and the inner lives of NPCs can sometimes leave a lot to be desired. In the words of John Ingold of Ingold Studios, Games promise you worlds with characters who respond to you, but the reality is they quite often give you worlds in which characters stand in one place, staring straight ahead, repeating the same line of dialogue, like some kind of vending machine. The best interrogation games, however, find creative ways to add depth to those characters and craft engaging interactions. The fourth major detective skill is hypothesis testing, which maybe needs the most explanation. This is sort of the inverse of deduction, as it works from theories to evidence instead of from evidence to theories. This is how detectives bring analytical reasoning into the real world and use its predictive power to search for confirmatory evidence. Here's a famous example from biology. In 1862, Charles Darwin was sent a species of orchid from Madagascar with an extremely long and narrow flower. This was a mystery because similar orchids are pollinated by moths, but there was no known moth able to reach the interior of the flower. Even though no such species had ever been discovered, Darwin predicted that there must exist a species of moth in Madagascar capable of extending its tongue over a foot in length. In his words, good heavens, what insect can suck it? Well, it's this one. In 1907, 21 years after Darwin's death, a subspecies of sphinx moth was discovered, which can indeed extend its proboscis a full foot in length. That's hypothesis testing. Based on evidence, the orchid, a deductive theory was formed which eventually led to the discovery of new confirmatory evidence, the subspecies of sphinx moth. This is getting kinda scientific. When detective games do this, it's a great way to promote player-driven progress. Instead of searching for evidence randomly, players make deductions that focus their search, which in turn can lead to discoveries that would never be made without a correct theory. Here's a minor example. In Telling Lies, which is all about watching recorded conversations, I noticed a character say she was doing great, thanks for asking. Assuming that must mean there was another video file that prompted this response, I searched the phrase, how are you, and located the corresponding, previously undiscovered video. Hypothesis correct. In The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, 
Holmes attributes this type of discovery to the power of imagination. See the value of imagination, said Holmes. We imagined what might have happened, acted upon the supposition, and find ourselves justified. Because it rewards player intention, gameplay based on hypothesis testing is a lot more satisfying than random chance or exhaustive pixel hunting. These four skills are the pillars of detective gameplay, and I find games that exercise them to be immensely satisfying. There's also another layer here that makes these skills special to me. Because in contrast to other video game skills, these skills are actually performed by the player. Here's what I mean. When I play Hollow Knight, I'm not actually swinging a tiny nail at insect enemies. And when I play Stardew Valley, I'm not actually harvesting crops. I'm just sat down pressing buttons on a controller. There's a level of abstraction between what's happening on screen and the player experience. But when I play detective games, I really am observing what's on screen. I actually am forming theories and deductions, and I'm actually thinking up creative ways to test my theories. That's cool. Now, before we begin the actual top 10, one of the curious things I've noticed after playing a ton of mysteries is that games about mysteries don't always involve detective mechanics and vice versa. For instance, Virginia is a narrative-heavy game about a rookie FBI agent investigating a mysterious disappearance. There's also corruption, conspiracy, and possibly paranormal phenomena thrown in. And although the ending is pretty darn ambiguous, there are still twists and big reveals throughout. That's a mystery, right? Well, this game presents a mystery, but it doesn't play like one. Although your character is solving a mystery, you, the player, are not. There are practically no choices to be made in this game, and even the ones you can make are completely perfunctory. The narrative can only progress in one way, and the game does not wait for you to advance the story. If you haven't yet wrapped your mind around what's happening, or even finished reading a document, well, too bad, because it's on to the next scene. In short, Virginia is a mystery, but it never makes you feel like a detective. By contrast, 2017's The Witness is not, in the same narrative sense, a mystery. But it does demand that you flex key detective skills, like environmental observation, deductive reasoning, and hypothesis testing. You will not progress in this game unless you reason out correct solutions, which means that, unlike Virginia, this game will never end unless you, the player, prove that you understand the world around you. But no matter how satisfying it is to master the myriad puzzles in The Witness, the game is not about a mystery. I suppose you could argue that the mystery here is about the nature of the island and your presence on it, but this game does nothing to build your curiosity about that question, and really, really doesn't care if you find an answer. Even if you do, the answer is only marginally more satisfying than because. So, there are games that present compelling mysteries and games that function mechanically like mysteries, but those ideas aren't always wedded together. I'm interested in games that do both, and I think my top 10 reflects that. I'll talk about more mystery dynamics as we go on, but I think it's time to start the countdown. Oh, and by the way, there will be light story and puzzle spoilers for all these games, but I won't spoil the ends or anything else I think is essential, because you should definitely check these games out for yourself if you think they sound interesting. And here we go. Number 10. Paradise Killer. Paradise Killer has some of the weirdest lore I've ever encountered in a video game, but I actually felt like the strangeness of the story enhanced my experience. It felt like one of the mysteries I was solving was the rules of this bizarre world in which I found myself, and that kept me on my toes the whole time. In Paradise Killer, you play as Lady Love Dies, a quasi-immortal investigation freak, recalled from a three million day exile to investigate the midnight slaughter of the Paradise Council. The characters of Paradise Killer currently reside on the 24th island in a series of iterative island utopias, attempting to produce the perfect paradise. This is because the previous 23 attempts have been spoiled by demonic influence. The residents of Island Sequence 24 are divided between the Syndicate, who are like an alternate reality cyberpunk bourgeoisie, and Citizens, who do all the work and get sacrificed at the end of each island cycle to generate the psychic energy that powers the next island sequence. You know, pretty boilerplate stuff. Paradise Killer is an open-world investigation, which means you're free to explore clues and interrogate suspects in any order. New discoveries open new dialogue options, and dialogue can open new areas, which means in practice you'll be running back and forth chasing leads and cross-checking stories. In general, this is my favorite format because it's so player-driven. Each player will have a different experience playing this game, even though the main story remains the same. It takes an impressive amount of work to build a mystery that works no matter how it's approached, but the payoff is a story that feels driven by player intention and discovery. The most interesting thing about Paradise Killer is the way it ends, and that means it's time to talk about the different ways that games test a player's deductions. There are basically four main ways this can go down. The first is what I'd call the linear structure. Games that follow this structure include the Frog Detective series, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, Gone Home, and Virginia. And the way that these games test your deductions is that they don't. 
Just keep wandering around and talking to everybody and reading things, and eventually the story will unfold. Obviously that's reductive, because some of those games are very cool, but the point is that you practically never have to pass a knowledge check in any of them. Paradise Killer features a second type of structure, which I'll call the final exam. In this structure, players have to prove their knowledge, usually at the end of the game, by answering a series of questions. This is the same way that a lot of mystery board games end, like Clue, Cryptid, or The Search for Planet X. So for instance in Clue, when a player thinks they have enough information to solve the mystery, they can trigger the end of the game by attempting to answer three central questions. We're trying to find out who killed him, and where, and with what! This sort of knowledge check is very straightforward, but it's also a bit problematic, because you can gain a lot of information from an incorrect guess. Like in Clue, checking your answer just reveals the solution. This is sort of alright in board games, because a wrong guess either eliminates you or opens the door for another player to solve the mystery first, but video games can't or won't impose either of those consequences, so sometimes you can just keep guessing. I don't think it's very satisfying to brute force a solution, so I try not to abuse this, but there have definitely been times I genuinely thought I was right, only for a game to correct me by showing me the actual answer, or by eliminating some of my very few multiple choices. Some of my favorites combat this in clever ways, but more on that later. Paradise Killer pulls off the final exam structure in a pretty unique way. The game ends in a trial, which you can choose to initiate at any time. I like that already, because the game leaves it to you to decide when you've investigated enough. At the trial, several different crimes are adjudicated in order of increasing severity, and for each crime you can choose to accuse whomever you want, and present any evidence you've gathered. If you don't have enough evidence, the case won't stick and the perp will walk. But the interesting layer here is that each crime has multiple suspects that can be accused successfully. This means that the big answers in Paradise Killer are open to interpretation, and you might walk away with a different answer depending on how thoroughly you've investigated. Most evidence in the game is circumstantial, and it's your job to concoct a cohesive narrative that ties it all together. That also means that this trial tests not only your deductions, but your morals. For instance, I had enough evidence to accuse one character of a crime, but I'd gotten to know them over the course of the game, and I liked them, and I didn't think the crime they possibly did was that bad, and besides, their motive even kinda made sense to me. So instead I pinned it on one of the biggest assholes in the game and let my friend off scot-free. That was satisfying in a different way, and it made me think of another Sherlock Holmes quote, where Holmes says he'd rather play tricks with the law of England than with his own conscience. It's a unique and interesting way to end a mystery, and definitely a fresh experience overall. So yeah, Paradise Killer is a neat game. It's my number 10, and if it sounds interesting, you should check it out. Number 9. Tangle Tower The second commercial release in the Detective Grimoire series is my pick for a mystery point-and-click adventure. Tangle Tower is not the strongest mystery in terms of gameplay, but it is just pure, uninterrupted fun. The animations are great, the characters are fleshed out and well-designed, and the story is equal parts quirky and sinister, like something out of a Lemony Snicket novel or a Wes Anderson film. The scene of the drama is the titular Tangle Tower, a cobbled-together Franken-mansion that houses the rival Pointer and Fellow families, and the crime is murder. Teenage artist Freya Fellow is found dead inside a locked room, a stab wound in her chest. The only other person in the room was the non-verbal family matriarch, Flora, whose portrait Freya was painting, but of more interest is the painting itself. Freya's unfinished canvas depicts Flora holding a bloody knife, which turns out to be covered not in red paint, but in actual blood. Enter Detective Grimoire and his snarky assistant Sally, whose mission is to investigate the scene, interview the residents of Tangle Tower, and find out once and for all if Freya was, in fact, murdered by a painting. Point-and-click mysteries tend to focus on two main aspects of detection, gathering clues and navigating conversations with suspects. That's how Tangle Tower works. Half your time is spent searching whimsical backgrounds for relevant clues, and the other half is spent interrogating suspects about said clues. Meanwhile, both of these activities are peppered with fun commentary and banter from Grimoire and Sally. Let's take a look at both. Hunting for clues involves clicking on anything that looks interesting in the environment. Sometimes objects are added to your inventory as major clues, which means you can ask suspects about them or use them to unlock other puzzles, but other times the environment is merely remarked upon or even verbally dismissed. I have to say I'm not a huge fan of this in general, from a gameplay perspective, because instead of having the player determine which clues are relevant to the investigation, you sort of just click away and then find out if a clue is relevant or not. Tangle Tower uses inventory clues to let you make breakthroughs with suspects, which is neat, but it also means that you can get to a point in the game where you have to check and recheck all the environments for that one clue that eluded you. I missed a few loose feathers in the rooftop garden and had to spend a long time unable to make any progress before I finally found them. To be clear, the reason that this is annoying is not because it's difficult, but because I had already made the mental connection the game wanted me to make, but it wouldn't let me ask NPCs about it until I found that exact specific clue. 
I should also say that Tangle Tower hides a lot of clues behind micro-puzzle mini-games, and I don't know, I like them. It's a bit disconnected from everything else that's going on, but they're fun, and you get a little rush of satisfaction when you intuit the solution. The best part of the game, though, is interrogating the Pointer and Fellow families. The characters in Tangle Tower are fantastic, and their personalities are further enhanced by solid voice acting and by each resident having their own musical theme. Once again, they could all be Lemony Snicket characters, from their eccentric interests and precocious talents to their alliterative names and family traumas. Every member of the conjoined family has secrets, vendettas, and suspicions, and I particularly like the way that each character recounts their actions on the night of the murder. We thought it was coming from Flora's tower. So we went up there. Her door was locked. Nobody was answering. So I made Fitz kick down the door. You can also ask residents about each other, or about every single object in your inventory. And although I like this game, I do consider that element to be kind of weak. Because there are no consequences for asking a suspect about wrong or off-topic pieces of evidence, like a time limit or the possibility of scaring off the true culprit, the obvious strategy is to ask everyone about everything. This effectively removes the need for you, the player, to put much thought into these interactions, turning them instead into rote, albeit helpful, info dumps. There is another aspect of interrogation here that I do find interesting, but before I talk about it, let's talk about the structure of Tangle Tower. Tangle Tower is a mix of the linear and final exam structures. The game unfolds in chunks, which allow for some freedom, but still have to be completed in order. At various points, you have to prove you're keeping up with the story by passing one or several knowledge checks. This is probably what the Detective Grimoire games are best known for, and also my favorite part of the game. In order to unlock new conversation topics, or sometimes just for Detective Grimoire to make a deduction, you have to complete mix and match sentences that connect evidence, testimony, and theories. The gramophone was Penny's pet, so she kept Fifi as a bargaining chip. Nope. This is good, because the number of possible combinations rules out blind guessing. And also, I have to echo the thoughts of Lucas Pope, who said of his own game. For me, always, the act of building a sentence was fun. This is one of those kind of like really um, carnal, sort of low-level joys, is just selecting those verbs and those nouns and, and subjects from a list and then having a sentence at the end that you could read was fun. Sometimes there's also a variation where instead of selecting nouns from a list, you create them by zooming in on specific parts of clues. I think this is even more clever, but it never quite felt like it was used to its maximum potential. I get that they're trying to make a game that appeals to everyone, so they can't amp up the difficulty too high, but it would be cool to see a game that takes this concept and plugs it into some really challenging puzzles. The ending of Tangle Tower does feel a little rushed, both in the sense that a bunch of things happen all at once, and because it ends kind of abruptly, but it doesn't dampen the pure joy of playing this game. And the story is good. Admittedly, by the end, I felt a lot more intrigued by the family history than by the identity of the murderer, but there are definitely plenty of good twists and reveals to keep you guessing, exploring, and making deductions. Number 8. Night in the Woods Of all the games on my list, this is the one that most stretches the definition of a mystery, but it definitely is one. What it lacks in heavy-hitting deduction, it more than makes up for with a killer story and some of the best writing in any indie game. Night in the Woods is about a tiny Rust Belt town called Possum Springs that's quietly fading into obscurity, and a troubled college dropout named Mae Borowski, who returns home to reconnect with her roots after an incident that shakes her to her core. Think Stephen King meets J.D. Vance. Oh, and all the characters are anthropomorphic animals. One thing this game does really well is build intrigue, and there are more than a few haunting questions, like the disappearance of an old friend, a Halloween kidnapping, a severed arm in the town square, a mysterious cult, and a shadowy figure who stalks May and her friends. All of these mysteries are set against the poignant backdrop of a tragic middle America that won't stop trying to relive its glory days, and a younger generation that can't seem to escape the small town of End Horizon. Night in the Woods never explicitly tests the player's knowledge, but it isn't strictly linear either. It's basically a cross between the linear structure and our third type of structure, which I'll call the limited timeline. In this approach, a game lasts for a certain amount of time, and when it ends, you know what you know, and that's that. That puts a lot of pressure on the player to use their time wisely, because every action comes at an opportunity cost. Spend too long questioning one suspect, and you might miss a chance to investigate a crime scene or stake out a location. There aren't enough hours in the day, so you have to make hard choices. I wouldn't say this game challenged my reasoning or critical thinking as much as most on this list, but it definitely grabbed my attention and didn't let go, and that's a huge part of why I love this game. It also managed to surprise me multiple times, both with dialogue and with story twists, and that doesn't happen too often. Parts of the game make you question your sanity and your grasp on reality. But maybe my favorite part of Night in the Woods is the atmosphere. This game has an amazing soundtrack, 
a stylish presentation, and strikes the perfect balance between lighthearted humor and spine-chilling horror. Despite being a cutesy game about talking animals, there's a real darkness beneath the surface of Possum Springs, and the game weaves together personal, paranormal, psychological, and sociopolitical themes into a story that will stick with you long after the credits roll. I won't spoil the ending, but somehow it was both bizarre and relatable at the same time. Maybe it only hits that way if you've experienced a town like this for yourself, but I have, and that made the darker aspect of the mystery feel uncomfortably familiar. I also really like the concept of solving a mystery with your friends. It feels like Scooby-Doo or Stranger Things, and the game captures the friend group dynamic really well. Sometimes you bounce ideas and theories around as a group, and other times you head off on adventures with individual friends that not only progress the story, but showcase some of the best writing in the game. It's kind of cheeseball, but by the end, they feel like your actual friends. Like most mysteries, Night in the Woods is best experienced for yourself, and if you're into good writing, the story is worth the investment. It's also surprisingly emotional, so be warned. Plus, in your spare time, you can shoplift at the Fort Lucene Mall, stargaze, or jam out on the bass guitar. And really, what more could you want? Number 7. Her Story Sam Barlow's 2015 database thriller is a one-of-a-kind experience that uses full-motion video to tell the somewhat convoluted story of a woman whose husband has presumably been murdered. The only thing your character does in the game is stare at a desktop monitor and use a search tool called the Logic Database to browse videos of a 1994 police interrogation. These interviews revolve around a woman called Hannah Smith, but are completely one-sided. You only ever get to see and listen to her answers, never the person asking the questions. The interviews are broken into short video clips, with each clip containing a single response and ranging anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes in length. What you actually do in the game is use the logic database to search for videos by keywords from the transcript. There are 271 video clips in the game, but each search only yields five results, the first five chronologically that contain the keyword. That means you have to get creative and specific with your keyword search. If you search a common word like the, you'll just get the first five videos on record. And a lot of words central to the story, like Simon, husband, missing, murder, or blood, appear many, many times in the transcript. So in order to access the later clips, you have to refine your search with additional keywords or new ideas. At the beginning of the game, you'll be constantly bombarded with new leads, which fosters freedom and player choice, because you have to decide which leads to follow up on and in which order. It's actually so overwhelming that you might want to physically take notes, which I like. I like the journey from a giant tangled mess to clarity and understanding. Later in the game, the leads dry up, and progress becomes dependent on your inference and imagination. And that's the secret sauce of her story, because you're not constrained by multiple choice, or by any other usual gameplay limitation. You can literally try any combination of words that occur to you, and the game won't open up unless you actually land on the right answers. That means that her story follows the fourth and final story structure. It's certainly not linear, it never asks you to answer direct questions, and you have all the time you want to explore the mystery, unlike its spiritual successor Telling Lies, which works exactly like her story but imposes a deadline and follows the limited timeline structure. In Telling Lies, you have until 5am to uncover as much of the story as you can, but in her story, the only limiting factor is what you can deduce. I'll call this the puzzle box structure, because like an actual puzzle box, you can try any approach you want, but unless you deduce the correct solution, the box won't open. Instead of proving your knowledge through an abstract final exam, you prove it through action. This kind of gameplay is centered around the skill I discussed earlier, hypothesis testing, and it probably has the highest number of players either giving up or resorting to walkthroughs, because it's common to feel like you've hit a brick wall. In this structure, the game will never, ever end unless you discover the answers, which can be frustrating, discouraging, rage-inducing, and for my money, the absolute best kind of mystery. Nothing quite compares to the satisfaction you feel at the end of a puzzle box mystery, because you yourself have actually solved a case. By the way, I did briefly debate whether to include Her Story or Telling Lies on this list, since they are very similar games, but two things tipped me in favor of Her Story. First, I just like the smaller scope of Her Story. It makes the game feel more focused, and while jumping around is fine, and a good tool for non-linear storytelling, and gives you something to do if you're ever stuck, too much jumping around just makes me feel less invested in the story for whatever reason. Telling Lies has a lot of different threads, and a lot of jumping around. Second, her story has a much stronger central question. The very opening line is basically, There has been a murder! What? Which gives you a clear mission right from the start. Find out who killed Simon Smith. That's not the case in Telling Lies, which begins more like, What should we be working on while you guys are talking? Do some, do some work. Seriously, this game has a very vague setup. It's like, well, some stuff happened, and, you know, go find out about it. I'm not saying the story in Telling Lies is bad, just that her story is a much tighter package. Okay, a few miscellaneous thoughts. The acting in her story, I think, is pretty good. 
This seems to divide some opinions online, but Viva Seifert, the actress who plays Hannah Smith, had a fairly difficult task given that she had to stick tight to a script, nail an emotional performance, and capture a few other nuances I won't spoil. I think she killed it. Without spoiling it, the story of her story had a few twists I didn't see coming, which definitely made the game a lot deeper and more complex than it seemed at first glance. I like the database checker, which tracks your progress and lets you know which pieces of the timeline are missing. That's really helpful and it's satisfying to fill in the gaps. I think by the end of the game, the story can be interpreted in a few different ways, and I'm normally not a fan of so much ambiguity, but I think it works here. Finally, this game, like many mystery games actually, is really fun to play with friends. That's how I played it, and it's collaborative and fun to throw it up on a screen and play as a group. Everyone watching noticed different details, and everyone had different leads they wanted to follow up on. Most of what you do in this game is watch video, so you could just replace a movie night with her story. And also, it's a very welcoming experience for people who don't normally play video games. If you're a fan of mystery games, story games, or just looking for a unique experience, you owe it to yourself to play this game. At this point, it's an indie staple, and while it has some imitators, there's nothing else quite like it. Number 6. Overboard. The year is 1935. The destination, New York, New York. The SS Hook is about to complete her transatlantic voyage when wealthy aristocrat Malcolm Villainsey is unceremoniously shoved over the railing and into a watery grave. The crime is murder, but the catch in Overboard is that the murderer is you. Inkle Studios' 2021 You Done It turns the classic detective novel on its head, casting you in the role of Veronica Villainsey, former West End starlet and Malcolm's extremely recent widow. Your task in the game is simple, hide all evidence of your crime, or better yet, with a huge life insurance policy on the line, pin the murder on someone else. But it won't be easy. Every passenger aboard the SS Hook has secrets of their own, suspicions of your crocodile tears, and their own share of knowledge about the villain Z's fateful nighttime stroll. It's up to you to plan out every last second of your final day at sea, which if you're not careful can also be your final day as a free woman. Every choice has consequences, and you'll have to decide who you can trust, who you can blackmail, and who might be better off sleeping with the fishies. Overboard is a visual novel that feels like it could have been written by Agatha Christie, and combines elements of choose-your-own-adventures and time management sims. It takes about 30-40 to 40 minutes to play through one in-game day, which lasts from roughly 8am to 4pm. During the day you can move throughout the ship, talking to passengers or investigating empty rooms. Whenever you move to a new room, the other passengers also move around the ship, depending in part on your actions. Eventually, the passengers gather in the restaurant for a Hercule Poirot-style open forum about the murder, at which point Veronica's fate is decided. You will almost certainly fail in your first attempt, but that's when this game really opens up. After punching a one-way ticket to Sing Sing, the game prompts you to restart the day, now armed with new objectives based on your previous run. And that means that now is a good time to talk about time loops. Time loops are a pretty popular trend in video games right now, but there's something about the formula that works really well for mysteries. That is because it encourages one of the best parts of detective games, experimentation. There's a freedom to make wild choices, because the time will just reset, and that means you can try a lot of ideas and gain an intimate knowledge of the game in service to your eventual golden run. For instance, in 12 Minutes, which is about a husband and wife whose evening is ruined by an extremely aggressive intruder, you play as the husband, stuck in a time loop, and you'll have to get to know every room in your small apartment in order to understand what secrets they hold, and how they can be used to aid your overall progress. You also have to learn, through experimentation, the behavior of both your wife and the intruder. What happens if you slip your wife's sleeping pills? Is it possible to ambush the intruder? What's hidden in the bathroom, or the closet? Can you turn the broken light switch to your advantage? You'll have to quote-unquote waste a lot of runs to figure all of this out, but that knowledge will ultimately empower you to solve the mystery. Or in the sexy brutale, a time loop mystery about a never-ending party in a casino mansion. You'll have to tail guests around the house in order to learn their exact schedules and ultimately use that information to save their lives from the murderous mansion staff. Overboard is not, like, diegetically a time loop. By which I mean, the game never explicitly explains or refers to the fact that Veronica is reliving the same day over and over again. But it still basically is one, and it's very satisfying to eventually attain godlike timing and knowledge of the ship. It also creates additional puzzles, as every possible action will open some doors but close others. For example, you'll soon learn that Veronica lost an earring on deck the night of the murder. That's bad, because it's potentially incriminating evidence. If you head to breakfast anyway, or don't realize you lost it, hawk-eyed gossip Lady Armstrong will comment on your singular earring, making it impossible to deny ownership of the missing jewelry later. Also, English gentleman Carstairs will inevitably find the other earring during his morning stroll on deck. One way to solve this issue is by hurling your earring overboard before leaving your cabin, and when presented with its lost counterpart, deny, deny, deny. 
However, you could also find a way to buy Carstairs Silence win your earring back on a game of cards, or plant the earring in your possession in another cabin to incriminate someone else. Or you could head topside first thing in the morning and beat Carstairs to the punch, but doing so will mean that you miss out on breakfast and the opportunity to chat with several other characters. The designers included a huge web of options and choices, but every action has consequences, and you'll have to experiment to learn how those consequences can best serve you. Overboard is a combination of the limited timeline and the puzzle box structures. A single run feels like a case of limited timeline, but in order to achieve more difficult objectives, like pinning the murder on someone else, avoiding a pesky blackmailer, or in one ending, murdering everyone else on the ship, you'll have to plan your steps and carefully reason your way to success. Achieving the full ending in Overboard feels like playing a puzzle box mystery. For what is essentially a choose-your-own-adventure, Inkle Studios did a good job of making your options feel almost limitless. You can play a full-blown blackjack minigame, snoop around the ship, seduce an officer, surreptitiously slip sleeping pills into Lady Armstrong's martini, or visit the chapel, where you can literally chat with God, who is something of a disapproving hint line and has the funniest writing in the game. It's hard to comment on the ending of Overboard because there are so many different ways it can end, but after ending up broke, in prison, and on the wrong end of blackmail a dozen times, it's extremely satisfying to eventually get away with murder. Number 5. Disco Elysium Disco Elysium is a massive, isometric, tabletop-inspired RPG from the mind of Estonian novelist Robert Kurvitz that blends existential angst, political struggle, and a retro disco aesthetic. It's soaked in themes of mental illness and substance abuse and corruption, and more than any other game on this list, it feels like a seedy, hard-boiled detective novel. The setting of Disco Elysium is a fictional, alternate history city called Revishol, which has been, in order, a monarchy, a communist state, and now a zone of control under the jurisdiction of a capitalist coalition occupation. The events of the game take place in the decaying underworld of a dock district called Martinez, which is currently troubled by a stalled truck convoy, private military contractors, and ongoing negotiations between a striking dock workers union and a private shipping conglomerate. There are two questions at the heart of Disco Elysium. The first is what happened to the bloated corpse in the backyard of the whirling in rags. The second is more existential. Who am I? Your character is an amnesiac detective coming off the back of a bender so intense you forgot to remember your own name. You were assigned to solve the murder, maybe, but you've gotten off track. The entire game is spent answering those two questions, and despite there being multiple points where you think you have it figured out, the truth keeps twisting away from you. Your base of operations is a shabby bar and motel called the Whirling in Rags, and throughout the game, a host of eclectic characters will cycle in and out of Martinez. The writing and the voice acting in Disco Elysium are incredibly sharp, but it's the characters that really steal the show. In particular, Kim Kitsuragi, your unflappable partner, a dispassionate voice of reason, and a reluctant pinball champion. Detective Kitsuragi is probably the biggest influence on your moral compass, or at least mine, as not disappointing him was one of my strongest motivations in the game. In addition to your fellow detectives and the residents of Martinez, some of the most prominent characters in the game are your own inner monologue. Each aspect of your psyche is given a distinct voice, and gives rise to its own suggestions and desires. What he's saying is, he's not from the Rat Squad, and isn't supposed to suspect such things. That's one of the ways that Disco Elysium captures detective work, by turning a lot of abstract aspects of human psychology into concrete systems. The gameplay in Disco Elysium is governed by 24 distinct skills, divided into four major categories, intellect, psyche, physique, and motorics. You'll level up these skills the same way you would in any RPG, and every skill has powerful effects on both your personality and on gameplay. Improve your electrochemistry skill and your tolerance of drugs and alcohol will skyrocket. Up your visual calculus and you'll be able to reconstruct a crime scene like Sherlock Holmes. Invest in esprit de corps and you'll have incredible synergy with your fellow cops. Enhance your savoir-faire and you'll become an undeniable king of cool. Play this game and you'll learn a lot of words you never knew before. If skills are underdeveloped, they can cause major problems, but skills can also become overdeveloped to the point that they become a hindrance. I, for example, invested heavily in the encyclopedia skill, which at medium levels provides useful information and context about the world around you. Some of this information is legitimately useful in drawing connections between events, but at higher levels, the encyclopedia skill begins to spout a never-ending stream of useless facts and trivia, to the point that it's difficult to sort out the relevant info from the miscellanea. The skill tree means that no two players will play this game in exactly the same way. You can play as a high-intellect super detective, a simple-minded bruiser, a charismatic smooth talker, or a bigoted, incompetent drug addict. The basic story of Disco Elysium never changes, but your dialogue, the details, and various outcomes will be different depending on how you approach the game. For instance, a suspect can be intimidated by the authority skill, convinced to cooperate by rhetoric or suggestion, deceived by drama, 
or you can genuinely build a rapport with empathy. That obviously allows for a lot of player freedom and a lot of replay value. Conversation and interrogation are the heart of Disco Elysium, and the game does a lot of interesting things that integrate skills and attributes into dialogue. This happens in two main ways. Sometimes you have to pass particular skill checks to advance a conversation, or to ask about a certain subject. This works exactly like a tabletop RPG, and is even represented on screen by a dice roll. About half of these are white skill checks, which means they can be attempted multiple times, but the other half are red checks, which means you've only got one shot to succeed. I mean, you could save scum, but the game is more exciting if you just plow full steam ahead. The second type of skill check would be difficult to replicate in an actual tabletop RPG, because the game is always calculating passive checks in the background. If you fail a passive check, you'll never even know. But if you pass one, the game will suggest new dialogue and gameplay actions. That's cool because it's one more way that different playstyles drive different outcomes. Disco Elysium is one of the best examples of the limited timeline. The game lasts 10 days, although it is possible to solve the mystery in less time. You can also die from normal threats like gunshot wounds or stabbings, but also from the withering existential dread of spying your own reflection in the mirror, or the unspeakable pain of turning on the bedroom light while hungover. Unless you die, the main story will inevitably occur, but a ton of parts and pieces and side mysteries can be permanently missed, and major parts of the main case can go unsolved forever. There are a lot of different story threads all happening at once, and a lot of different places to direct your energy. The game is open world, and filled with tough choices of how to spend your time. Most side stories can be resolved in different ways, and are all interconnected. Early decisions can impact later parts of the story in major ways, and even your companion at the end of the game depends on your choices. The ultimate solution has lots of layers, but as with all mysteries in the game, Disco Elysium paints violence as the inevitable outcome of an unstable world caught in the merciless churn of communism, capitalism, and the state. That said, the actual details of the ending had me feeling like... No, communism was just a red herring. I won't spoil the final confrontation, but either way, Disco Elysium is an unforgettable RPG on an epic scale. Unlike most mysteries, you can play it multiple times, and half the fun is finding out who you are as a detective. Number 4. The Paines Creek Killings This is the only walking simulator on my list, and that's on purpose. If you're not familiar with the term, the phrase walking simulator began as a derogatory description of games in which you more or less do nothing but walk around 3D environments, but the term has taken on a more neutral connotation, as appreciation for the genre has grown and some games have added more complexity to the formula. This is actually the last game I added to my top 10, and that's because I was debating which walking simulator to include. Obviously, it's my list, I could have included multiple walking simulators, and I would have if I thought it was merited, but at the same time I was trying to make this list pretty diverse. That's for two reasons. First, I just think it's fun to talk about a wide variety of games, but second, I have a hard time fully loving a game when there's another game that I feel does the same thing but better. Now I've played Dear Esther, Gone Home, What Remains of Edith Finch, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, Firewatch, and The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, and there's a case to be made that those are all mysteries of a kind. Of those games, my favorite game is Edith Finch, because of the writing, the atmosphere, and just the incredibly unique storytelling. However, before I played the Payne's Creek Killings, Gone Home is probably the game that would have made this particular list, because I think it's more of a mystery than Edith Finch. But the Payne's Creek Killings does a few things that elevate it above the rest of the walking simulators, at least as a detective game. It's about a cold case from 1995 in which a woman called Vivian Roberts was brutally murdered in the quiet town of Payne's Creek. A string of other murders followed this one, hence the plural title. You mark my words, there'll be killings next! The actual premise of the game is a little meta, because you play as a journalist in 1999, investigating the work of a private detective in 1997, who in turn was investigating the original incident. By 1999, the town of Paines Creek has been completely abandoned, so you wander around a ghost town, attempting to uncover what really happened four years earlier. Luckily, everyone and their brother kept about 50 diaries, so you get to explore a complex tangle of personal, romantic, and family dramas that brought tragedy to this ill-fated town. There's also dozens of secret passageways, hidden compartments, and roughly a million keys of every shape and size imaginable. And that's what elevates the Paines Creek killings above its more linear relatives. Most walking simulators are completely or quasi-linear, in that their stories are always experienced rather than driven by the player. The Payne's Creek Killings, however, is of the puzzle box variety. At times, this game can be frustratingly obtuse, and some of the breadcrumb trails of clues can feel a little random. But if you enjoy a giant, thinky scavenger hunt, then you'll be completely hooked. The game is full of sprawling macro puzzles, and always teases you with areas, rooms, and compartments that are just out of reach, but contain tantalizing pieces of missing evidence. It does not hold your hand whatsoever, in any way, which some won't like, but it makes player intention the star of the show. You decide where to go, what to investigate, and what's important. On that note, one of my favorite things about the Payne's Creek Killings is the camera. 
It's basically just a point and shoot screen capture mechanic, but the reason I like it is because instead of the game deciding which pieces of evidence I should care about, I get to. The inventory menu tracks all of your photos, and it's your job to sort out patterns from the noise. This game has genuinely creepy elements, and the story has enough layers to keep you excited by new reveals. The truth is out there, but you'll have to rack your brain and scour every last inch of Payne's Creek if you want to bring it to light. Like always, I enjoy that open world style that allows you to latch onto story threads from multiple starting points, and it helps craft a unique experience for every player. If I had one complaint about this game, it's that near the end you'll have to engage in a seriously annoying amount of backtracking, but I have to say that's kind of the price you have to pay for nonlinearity. I enjoyed my time in Payne's Creek, and I thought I understood exactly what kind of game it was. Until... the ending. I'm not going to spoil it, but I have to talk about the end of this game. At a certain point, late in the game, you discover a confession from the killer, at which point the game takes a wild turn. It's less of a story twist and more of a leap into an entirely different genre. This will likely be the most divisive thing about the game, and I'm still not sure how I feel about it. It is undoubtedly memorable and full of tension, but it does in some ways undercut the rest of the game. I mean, the mere existence of a confession is like the one element of the game that gift wraps a conclusion instead of letting you form it for yourself. Nevertheless, I can commend the creators for making a courageous and unexpected choice. You will not forget this ending. By the way, EQ Studios, the team behind Payne's Creek Killings, is currently developing a more episodic game called Scene Investigators, which I'm looking forward to playing eventually. It just got delayed again, but according to the Steam page, it's supposed to be even more of a logic puzzle than the Payne's Creek Killings. The Steam page mentions close observation, careful analysis, and calculated assumptions, and that sounds right up my alley. In A Note for TPK Fans, EQ says that, in short, The Payne's Creek Killings is a story-rich game, while Scene Investigators is a deduction reasoning game. If it lives up to that promise, it should be well worth checking out. Number 3. Unheard. Mystery games involve a lot of reading, and I mean a lot. There's case files, diaries, letters, logbooks, notebooks, actual books, ripped up pages, the white pages, web pages, dialogue trees, and even your own inner monologue. But hey, maybe you're the kind of person who prefers audiobooks, and if so, this might be the game for you. Unheard is a game that demands your full attention, but instead of running around reading a bunch of text, you sit down and listen to a bunch of audio. The premise of Unheard is that you're granted access to recordings of unsolved mysteries, and your job is to sift through the recordings and analyze crimes through the lens of high-tech audio surveillance software. It's a really unique experience, and not one I've heard a lot of people talk about. The game is best played with headphones, and I don't know, it's fairly abstract, but it's also one that just really gripped me. Unlike most of the other titles here, Unheard is a series of shorter cases, like a drug bust, an art theft, a murderous theatrical production, and a bombing at a police station. Each case is represented on screen by a map that looks like an architectural floor plan, and your character, quote unquote, is a disembodied avatar that floats around the map listening to nearby sounds and dialogue. What are you talking about? Of course the painting you gave me is fake, but I swapped it with the real one in the storeroom. Wasn't that our plan all along? And that's really all you do in this game. Scrub the timeline back and forth and move your all-hearing avatar around the map. You're given two basic instructions. Match each voice in the scenario with its speaker, and answer a few questions about the case. In that sense, Unheard plays the final exam structure completely straight. You can try to solve the case whenever you're ready, and the questions are always on screen. Which on the one hand is good, because it provides some direction for your audio surveillance. But on the other hand, the question itself can sometimes spoil the answer. For instance, in the theater case, everyone keeps talking about whether Emily's death was a murder or an accident. Like, it's a big point of contention between several characters. But then, one of the on-screen questions, which is visible the whole time, asks you to answer who organized Emily's murder. And spoiler alert, accident is not an option. And yes, that is a typo right there. Although, this game is translated from Chinese, but still. I should say that the voice acting is pretty good, for the most part. That's important, because your whole time playing this game is spent listening to dialogue. Some of the dialogue is a little on the nose, but I think it's kind of necessary to get certain ideas across. The voice actors all sound distinct from one another, and there's enough variety in the performances to keep it interesting. I was personally intrigued by all of the setups, except for the first one, which is basically a tutorial. And I also like the fact that the game never gives you time to get bored with any one scenario. Even though every player will ultimately experience the same story, there's a lot of freedom in how you approach it. At the start of a new scenario, for instance, you could choose to follow a single character through the environment and see what they get up to. Or you could stake out one location and pay attention to who passes through and what goes down. You could follow a story thread, or an object, or check out a room that gets mentioned in conversation. You can watch the whole scenario straight through, or pause and rewind every 30 seconds to get a better idea of which events are happening simultaneously. 
you'll need to rewind again and again, actually, as information from, say, an overheard conversation in a restroom might completely recontextualize a conversation somewhere else. Sometimes one character will speak on the phone to a different character in some other location, but you can only hear one speaker at a time and have to mentally stitch together the complete conversation. The big picture is always nebulous and obtuse and difficult to wrap your mind around because it can never be viewed in its entirety. It reminds me of the parable of the blind men and the elephant, which was popularized in English by the John Godfrey Sachs poem. In the parable, a group of blind men each interact with a different part of the elephant, and each one forms a different conclusion about what kind of creature it is, depending on whether they felt the tusk or the trunk or the tail, etc. Unheard is a game about comparing stories, considering different perspectives, and trying to imagine the elephant. My main complaint about this game is that it's shorter and a little easier than I'd like. I guess it's ultimately a positive when I complain about a game being too short, and it's worth noting that there are two free DLCs, although so far only one has been translated into English. It was, however, excellent, and definitely a step up in difficulty and complexity from anything in the base game. It's about two rival gangs meeting at a resort to exchange stolen goods, and a group of actors who are playing the gang members. The result is chaos and confusion that plays out a bit like who's on first. The DLC also features a set of final questions that are far more resistant to blind guessing, which is something I would not have done anyway, but still, you have to really know your stuff if you want to succeed here. Critics of this game will say that all you're doing is listening to the evidence and trying to piece together what's happening, but I don't find that to be a passive experience at all. After all, what is detective work if not gathering evidence, thinking it all through, and arriving at conclusions? There's plenty of eureka moments to be had in Unheard, and it is definitely a unique experience. Plus, it can be played in installments, so definitely check this one out. Number 2. Return of the Oberdin. In some ways, Lucas Pope's 2018 insurance claim investigation is the gold standard of mystery games, and maybe the game you most expected to see on this list. I was actually torn for a while between my first and second spots, but my top two were always my top two. Return of the Oberdin has one or two minor flaws, which is what decided me in favor of my number one, but the intricate deduction and the calamitous story are insanely fun, and the resulting combination is one of the most purely distilled detective experiences ever made. It's also presented in a stunning one-bit graphical style, accompanied by an upbeat adventurous soundtrack, and wrapped in a compelling 19th century nautical theme. The premise of this game is that a merchant vessel called the Oberdin set sail from England in 1802 with 60 assorted crew members and passengers, but disappears without a trace before reaching her destination. Five years later, the Oberdin drifts into port, completely abandoned except for a few sun-dried corpses. As a representative of the East India Company, your job is to climb aboard, investigate the fates of every last passenger, and ultimately discover what happened on the disastrous voyage. In these tasks, you are aided by two very helpful objects, which were provided to you by someone with first-hand knowledge of the Oberdin. The first is a book that contains the crew manifest, sketches of life at sea, diagrams of the ship's layout and planned route past Africa, and other bits of inside information. I'll talk more about the book later. The second is a mysterious paranormal pocket watch called the Memento Mortem. When used on the remains of a dead passenger, the pocket watch lets you hear whatever the victim heard just before they died, and explore a three-dimensional freeze frame of the exact moment they gave up the ghost. This effect can be extrapolated to view the final moments of other corpses found within these memories, which means that eventually you can reconstruct every death that occurred aboard the Oberdin. That's only the start of your difficulties, however, as your real task in the game is to identify every single soul on board. The result is what feels like a complicated Sudoku puzzle, in which every scene provides vital context for half a dozen other deaths and identities. Each death, and therefore each character, has a corresponding entry in the book, and this is where you actually solve the mystery of the Oberdin, by entering, for each passenger, who they are, how they died, and, if applicable, who killed them. However, the game will not immediately tell you if you're correct, which prevents you from brute forcing a single solution. Instead, fates are solved in sets of three. Every time you complete three correct entries, the game will confirm your answers, and the handwritten solutions will become typeset. This also means that outside the first view, the fates can be solved in any order, and some faces will appear many times before you eventually learn their name or their fate. Some of the deaths are fairly obviously shootings, or stabbings, or clubbings, but you'll soon enter a wider world of possibilities as the Oberdin veers into the terrifying realm of myth and folklore. In any case, the most difficult part of the game is not deducing the cause of death, but the identity of the victim. 
It's very hard to talk about this game without spoiling major realizations, but some of the ways you might deduce a passenger's identity include listening to an accent and cross-checking nationalities on the crew manifest, paying attention to where they sleep and comparing their whereabouts to diagrams of the ship's quarters, watching who they spend their time with and noticing whether they give or take orders from anyone in particular, taking note of their uniform or lack thereof, and paying close attention to other distinguishing features like shoes, hairstyles, or tattoos, combing through dialogue for valuable mentions of names, places, and other identifiers. Straight up process of elimination. Maybe you know that such and such person is a midshipman, and now you've identified all the other midshipmen, and voila. Nine times out of ten, the information needed to deduce a passenger's identity is found somewhere other than their own death scene, which is how Return of the Oberdin really tests your understanding and your powers of deduction. For example, in one scene, a man's head is blown clean off by a cannon. It's pretty obvious how he died, but the lack of a head makes identification a tricky prospect. You'll have to navigate to an earlier moment, in the previous death scene, to see the moments just before the cannon blast. That means you have to understand the chronology, and find the corpse that died around the same moment. Or you can notice the headless man's knocked off top hat, and make a connection with an even earlier scene. There's multiple ways to identify a corpse, but almost all require connecting several different scenes. And that's a tame example. Sometimes identifying information is even further removed from the moment of death, making it even more difficult to form a connection. In fact, it's so difficult, it would be almost impossible to wrap your mind around the events of the game without the use of the book. And Lucas Pope thought so too. I was really worried the whole game that I'm asking way too much from the player. And the book itself is kind of my solution to that, to help the player understand what is going on, who is who, to, to, to let them traverse the web a little easier. I haven't talked about this yet, but many mystery games, including my number one game, use a book or menu or an interface of some kind to help the player organize their thoughts. Actually, this serves two purposes. First, to make the details of the mystery more manageable. But second, to drive player curiosity with the promise of undiscovered answers. In Return of the Oberdin, the book is divided into ten chapters, with intriguing titles like Unholy Captives, Murder, and The Doom. These chapters are not explored chronologically, or even necessarily as a unit. So you'll have to discover most or all of the corpses on the Oberdin in order to fully understand the proper sequence of events. Chapter 8, Bargain, is completely hidden from the player until they solve all of the fates which means it lies in wait as the ultimate source of intrigue in the game. I'll talk more about that in a minute. As much as I love the complex deductive reasoning and freedom to investigate organically, Return of the Oberdin would be nothing without its story or its characters. The characters are not only puzzle pieces in an elaborate mystery, but fully formed individuals, many of whom personify the extremes of human behavior in an emergency. There are dozens of individual story threads, including tales of redemption and heroism, greed or betrayal. Almost every character in the game has discernible motivations, which you will often need to infer, but despite the crew facing an onslaught of natural threats, like storms and eldritch creatures of the deep, Return of the Oberdin never forgets that the greatest conflicts and the greatest acts of evil come from within. The story in Return of the Oberdin is the best kind of crazy. The opening scene, which is the last chapter chronologically, depicts a violent mutiny, and things only get more bonkers from there. Every time you think you've seen it all, the game finds a way to one-up itself, with gnarlier deaths, deeper mythology, and a few deliciously ironic twists. This actually ties into my biggest criticism, which is that the ending is kind of disappointing compared to the rest of the reveals. After experiencing all the other dramatic events and escalations, I guess I was expecting something more mind-blowing from the final chapter, but I honestly thought it was a bit of a letdown. A good twist should add new information, or recolor your perspective of past events, but this one does neither. However, that does not in any way dampen my enthusiasm for this game, which will definitely go down as one of the all-time greats. Not only as a mystery, but as a straight-up masterpiece of interactive storytelling. So far, most of the mysteries I've talked about feel like detective novels, but as I've said, that doesn't have to be the case. Return of the Oberdin, for instance, is more of a tragic thrill ride through deadly nautical superstition than a classic detective story. Games like Paradise Killer and Strange Horticulture are even further removed from our familiar reality, one being set in an alternate future and the other in a fantasy realm. But my number one mystery is removed further still because it happens a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. My number one indie mystery is Outer Wilds. This game is absolutely fantastic, and an experience I will truly never forget. I'm going to try my best not to spoil anything major, because this is a game you should really enter as blind as possible, but here goes. 
Outer Wilds is an interstellar time loop mystery that mixes realistic and mind-bending astrophysics with a quirky camping theme. Seriously, you'll alternate between piloting a rickety spaceship and roasting marshmallows over an open flame, as you solve a surprisingly deep archaeological mystery about the rise and fall of a long-gone alien race, and the reverberations of their actions through to the present day. At times terrifying, at times heartwarming, and always mysterious, Outer Wilds is a game that equally demands and rewards your curiosity. In Outer Wilds, you play as a new recruit in the burgeoning space program on tiny Earth-like planet Timber Hearth. It's your first day on the job, but on your way to grab the launch codes, you inadvertently form a strange bond with a mysterious alien relic in the local museum. The relic belongs to an extinct alien race called the Nomai, who built structures all over your pocket-sized solar system before dying of unknown causes. One of your only tools in the game is a device that deciphers the spiral Nomai script, and one of the missions of the Harthian space program, otherwise known as Outer Wilds Ventures, is to investigate the origins and the disappearance of the Nomai. However, this game does not hold your hand, and you are free to explore any and all corners of the solar system in your trusty spaceship, pursuing whatever leads or mysteries that catch your attention. The solar system itself is a stunningly designed physics playground that includes mind-bending planets like Brittle Hollow, which is collapsing into a black hole at its core, Giants Deep, which might as well be the big water planet from Interstellar, the Hourglass Twins, a pair of binary planets that orbit one another and slowly pass sand back and forth like halves of an hourglass, and Dark Bramble, an M.C. Escher-inspired planet torn apart by parasitic vines. Well, nothing gold can stay, and after 22 minutes, the solar system and everything in it, including you, is ripped into oblivion when the sun goes supernova. Luckily, there are time shenanigans afoot, and your character wakes up exactly where the day began. This is where the mystery really begins. The main questions are these. What happened to the Nomai? What is the mysterious Ash Twin Project? And why are you stuck in a time loop? What is your connection to the Nomai statue in the museum? And most importantly, why is the sun going supernova? And is there anything you can do to stop it? Outer Wilds is my favorite mystery for three main reasons. The first of which is that it's just plain fun. And this is where I'm going to confess something to you. The actual gameplay in some of my other top 10 mysteries isn't always that fun. Her Story, Overboard, and Night in the Woods can be a bit too passive at times. Parts of Paradise Killer and Disco Elysium and the Payne's Creek killings are kind of a slog. Even Return of the Oberdin starts by dragging the player from memory to memory before it lets you fully take the reins. But Outer Wilds is always consistently fun. Whether you're plumbing the depths of the disintegrating Brittle Hollow, performing hasty science experiments in a laboratory being slowly buried by sand, or attempting to dock your spaceship with the rapidly rotating sun station. It's not possible. No, it's necessary. I just enjoy the act of exploration and discovery. I like wandering around this solar system, and even the hard parts of the game that demand tricky platforming or maneuvering are satisfying to get right. The second reason I love Outer Wilds is that it's a really good mystery, in multiple ways. For one, the way it piques your curiosity with breadcrumb trails of evidence always keeps you engaged. The game actually has three or four major mysteries, each of which is supported by a dozen or so smaller mysteries and points of interest. All of this is tracked by the ship's log, which is one of the best parts of the game, and organizes a lot of your adventures. These mysteries all point to one another, so you'll often find leads about one mystery while investigating another. Most NPCs in the game, and most fragments of Nomai writing, offer enticing hints about things you haven't even heard of, which means your head will constantly be filled with new leads to pursue. According to Alex Beecham, the creative director of Outer Wilds, this system was specifically inspired by Wind Waker, where residents of Windfall Island will mention curiosities found on islands around the Great Sea, which in turn fuels player desire to explore the Uncharted. I also love the way you solve mysteries in Outer Wilds. Outer Wilds is all about learning new rules, be they laws of quantum physics or quirks of this particular universe, and applying those rules to make progress. Several areas in the game are designed to teach you new rules, like this grove on Timber Hearth that teaches you how quantum objects change locations whenever they aren't being observed. I will never get over the fact that the only upgrade in this game is knowledge. You could literally beat this game on the very first run, but you won't, and the nerve of the designers to hand you that freedom is seriously impressive. This makes Outer Wilds the ultimate puzzle box mystery, because the only way to beat the game is by gathering information, forming hypotheses, and ultimately testing your deductions through action. The third reason I love Outer Wilds is for its emotional core. In some ways, Outer Wilds did for the space mystery what Inception did for the heist thriller. Those genres aren't supposed to have real emotional stakes and through lines, right? Except Outer Wilds does, and that grounds the story in real human, or alien, emotion. Your primary connection in the game is to the other astronauts of Outer Wilds Ventures, and part of your journey is to regroup with your fellow sojourners throughout the solar system. Each is associated with a particular planet, and a particular instrument, and at any moment you can point your signal scope at the stratosphere and hear familiar melodies drifting across the cosmos. It reminds you that you're not alone, and after you beat the game, maybe hits even harder. The other emotional element of Outer Wilds is your galactic predecessors, the Nomai. 
The story of the Nomai is surprisingly tragic, and the fact that you learn their story achronologically can lead to bittersweet realizations or moments of horrifying irony. Despite being a mystery about blue, four-eyed aliens exploring space, Outer Wilds is a game about hopes, fears, and passing the torch. And the end of the game feels like a culmination of everything, in the best possible way. As if you needed another reason to play Outer Wilds, it has one of the best DLCs of all time, Echoes of the Eye, which explores a tangential mystery even older and darker than the main game. It doesn't have as much space exploration, and isn't as chaotic as base Outer Wilds, but it tells an equally compelling and deeply thematic story that you won't soon forget. The major theme in Echoes of the Eye is light, hidden in the darkness, and this theme appears many, many times, both mechanically and as a story beat. If you played this DLC, you know what I mean. You'll wield your trusty flashlight to control locks, empower slide reel projectors, and ultimately face what's hidden in the dark. And on that note, Echoes of the Eye also dips into genuine horror at times, which I think is perfect for a mystery shrouded in the icy blackness of space. I don't want to spoil anymore, but the twists and rules of the strange new world are even more mind-blowing than those in the base game. All of this combines to make Outer Wilds the greatest mystery I've ever played, and my top pick for an indie mystery. So there you go. That's it. That's my top 10. There's so many mysteries out there, I honestly feel like I've barely scratched the surface, but I definitely had a great time with all of these games. I could talk more about most of them, and maybe at some point I will get around to a few shorter, spoilerific discussions or reviews. If you've played some or all of these games, tell me in the comments what you think of them. And if you haven't, I'm curious to know which ones appeal to you the most and why, or what you think are the ingredients of the perfect mystery game. What are some games that didn't make this video? I obviously dig a good mystery, so let me know if there's a game I absolutely have to check out. This video took me way too long to make, but I finally finished it, so thank you for watching and listening to me rant about indie games. Before you go, here's a few quick words about the direction of this channel. I haven't given up on making Zelda content. In fact, I have one video that's mostly complete, and another really big idea for a video, but it was always my plan to broaden the scope. Early on in the pandemic, I set out to make a video ranking my all-time favorite indie games. I love the creativity and risk-taking and freedom to experiment that comes from smaller creators, and I was excited to highlight a few of my favorites. But as I thought about what to include, I started to feel like a bit of an imposter. There were major titles I had never played, landmarks of game design I'd never grappled with, giant gaping holes in my indie knowledge. Who was I to pronounce on the greatest indie games of all time? Look, it's 2022, anyone with a Wi-Fi connection can weigh in, but I wasn't satisfied. I set a goal to play at least 100 indie games before revisiting the topic. A modest goal, perhaps, compared to the explosion of indie titles on the market, but it was a start. Well, I've now recorded over 100 playthroughs and counting, and along the way, I've discovered new favorites, re-evaluated my own tastes, and amassed a virtual mountain of footage and notes. And I don't want to let that work go to waste, so I've been planning a series of videos on all things indie, from reviews and rankings to story and design analysis. If that sort of thing appeals to you, subscribe to the channel and come back for more. There's always more to talk about, and I really appreciate you coming along for the ride. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.